At our, I, I, remember, I remember it pretty, pretty clearly. At our, our previous church, it was 2011, we had, I just started there, I was a young adult pastor there, and they were having their version of VBS. It wasn't VBS, it wasn't all week, it was called day camp uh, for kids. It was, it was two days for kids, and, they were, they were, and it was all day long, and they were getting it set up. And our children's pastor, uh, he was a little bit crazy, so he had all these interesting, interesting activities that they were going to have the kids do. And one in particular sticks in my mind, and then this one, um, it, it sounds easy enough. They had set up in the parking lot in a parking uh, stall. They had set up on one side, you were going to have a, a child over here, and on the other side, there was some sort of um, prize or some sort of good thing that they could get. All they had to do was walk a- across the area. Well, let's call the good thing a Twinkie, okay? I don't remember what it was, but let's call it a Twinkie. Every, every kid loves a Twinkie, right? And if you don't like a Twinkie, you can insert your favorite uh, hostess um, thing there, okay? So they were, that's all they had to do. They had to just walk from where they were to where the Twinkie was, and then they would get that prize. A couple complicating factors. First complicating factor, they had to do so while blindfolded, right? Makes it a little more challenging to get across it blindfolded. But that's not, that's not the real one. Like that, that's like, okay, anyone could do that, right? You just kind of visualize, you hold it in your mind. The real, the real trick was they had to do so while blindfolded, while navigating 50 to 100 set mousetraps uh, that were between them and said Twinkie. Now, I'm not sure who approved this idea. I was just coming on staff, so I had nothing to do with this at the time. I never heard any stories of somebody getting their toes squished by the mousetrap, so I don't think it went horribly bad. But, but here's what they did. They, they had the, you, a kid blindfolded, a prize over here, in between this minefield of set mousetraps. I'm assuming they had their shoes on. I'm hoping they didn't make them take their shoes off. And then they had a friend or a leader who was off to the side calling out instructions to them. It was an exercise in listening and in instruction giving. And so the, the friend or leader, they would, they would just give them instruction. Of course, the person would walk very slowly because you don't want to step on the mousetrap, right? And they would just give them instructions a little bit, you know, six inches to the right. Okay, six inches to the right. And then a foot forward, okay, and then a foot forward. Now, now a foot to the left, okay, a foot to the left. And, now, and, now for, and they would walk them through this maze by, by giving them instructions. Now, now this exercise, uh, this, this little game that they had, getting to the, the good thing, whatever it was, Twinkie, whatever it was, what was necessary was that they would hear the instructions and that they would, and, and that the instructions were accurate, Right? Like if you had some like dingbat over there who's like, you know what, I'm going to put him in every mousetrap I can. <laughs> Sounds like something I may have done when I was a boy. But as long as the person who was giving the instructions was trustworthy, what, what they had to do was follow them very closely to get where they needed to go. As long as what the person was telling them what was, the, what was true how the person with the blindfold on responded to that truth determined the outcome, whether they stepped on a mousetrap or whether they got a prize at the end. And friends, that's, that's a silly little game, silly little thing, right? But there's, there's a parallel there because in life there's... there's Often there's all kinds of stuff around us. We're making decisions and choices, and we're, we're going to go from here. We're going to go into tomorrow, right, which is Memorial Day, which probably many of us have off. We'll be celebrating. We're going to go into a week that will be full, and we're going to make decisions and choices about how we're going to live our lives and how we're going to navigate through those decisions in life. And the outcome in many ways, is dependent on how we respond to the truth of the situation and where we we get that truth. And so this morning, we're going to turn once again back to Luke chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn there with me. Luke 11, verse 27 to 44 is our text. We're, we're we're, We're going through the gospel of Luke. We're taking a couple years to do so. We're doing it in chunks. 
And we're in this section of Luke where Jesus is journeying from Galilee. This is the way Luke has set it up. He's journeying. He set his face to go to Jerusalem where he's going to fulfill his mission, which is to die on the cross to pay for the, the penalty of the, of the sin of the world. And he's on this journey with his disciples from Galilee to Jerusalem. This is the way Luke has framed this. And he's teaching them about what it means to follow him. What does it look like? What does it require? What can you expect? And he said a number of things. The very first thing he said is, it's going to be costly, guys. You're going to follow me? You want to, you want to follow me and what I'm doing in the world, bringing God's freedom and favor? It is going to be costly. It's not going to be easy. People aren't going to necessarily thank you for doing so. He said, when you go out, you're going to have to go out, and the manner in which we go out is with compassionate mercy. That was the parable of the Good Samaritan. He called them to go, to go out. That was one of the things. He sent out the 72. That's part of us following Jesus, to go out into the world, the place we live, work, and play, to bring God's freedom and favor. A couple weeks ago, I talked about how we will definitely be opposed. We will face opposition. And this morning, we, we are looking at this, this next thing, which is Jesus coming to us and saying, whose voice do we need to listen to and what do we need to do about it? So Luke eleven twenty seven 27 down to 44 is the text. I'm, actually, the text goes all the way down to 52, but just in the interest of time this morning, uh, we can, we can kind of get the flavor for the last section. There's four sections here that we're going to look at. And don't miss the first one. The first one, it, it seems like, eh, it's just this little story, but I think it's, it's the, the, the point of what follows. Luke uh, eleven twenty seven. 27, if you want to turn there in the Pew Bible, it's on page 870 in the Pew Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you this one, the, the one that's in the pew in front of you. Please take it home, read it. We believe this is the truth, God's truth that we need to live by. So Luke 11, verse 27, as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her, there we go, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. Sorry, I'm having trouble. Blessed is the, the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, this is Jesus, and you, and you think, Jesus, what are you doing here? Why, you know, can't you just take a compliment? But, but, but he's, he's using this as an opportunity to teach. Verse 28, but he said, Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And I think this is the point in the, the verse that kind of controls and runs through the next few sections. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And you go into this next section. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here." The men of Nineveh, Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, but when it is bad, your body is full of darkness." Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. And there's another story. He's, he's, <laughs> he's just getting in people's faces, kind of here. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at table. And the Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner, that he didn't take the time to do the outward ritual that all the good Pharisees would do. And the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees, you cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you fools. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. 
But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. So this morning, I want to focus us on what is the big thing that Jesus is doing here. There are, there are four sections, and if you just read them back to back, you might, you might miss it, but I think they're all connected, and I think they're all connected by this first section. So we're going to look at that, and then, then I want to look at what I'm going to call two mousetraps, two, two bad things that we would want to avoid, and two Twinkies. Or two, two good things that this, this text is offering us if we do what he says. And then I just have at the end two questions. So, so the, the big idea, I think, is, is found in verse 28. And it's that as followers of Jesus, we're going to follow him. We need to hear and obey God's word, what God says. We need to hear and obey what God says in his word. Hear it and obey it. I think that's what he's saying in Luke eleven, twenty-eight. This woman makes this very nice pronouncement, and she's not wrong. She says, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nurse. And if you if you turn back in your Bible back to you don't have to do that, but if if you were to, in Luke chapter one, the angel comes to Mary and he says, He says, You're gonna have this this son, this is who he's gonna be. And you know what she says? She says, All generations are gonna look at me and they're gonna call me blessed. Because God has done this for me. So this woman is not wrong in what she's saying. Jesus' mother was blessed to be the mother of Jesus. It was a huge blessing for her. But Jesus doesn't want to focus on that. He wants to focus on something bigger and something deeper. Verse 28, Jesus says, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are those who do two things. They hear it and they keep it. Now, hearing, hearing involves taking it in, right, in my little analogy at the beginning. If you're walking through a, a, a bunch of mousetraps, and the only thing that's going to get you through those mousetraps is the voice of somebody calling out directions to you, the last thing you want to do is put in earplugs, right? That would just be silliness. That would be to cut yourself off from the source of, of help in that situation, So there's the hearing, and then there's the keeping, there's the heeding, there's the, oh, I'm I'm saying obeying, that's what he's saying when he says keep it. The diligence to, to, as we hear what God says, to then respond appropriately, to obey. This is what he's calling his disciples to do, and us, hear and obey, and he says the word of God. The Word of God. Now, almost well, every week, we, we, in various ways in the service, we read the Scripture, we talk about it, we try to go through it and walk through it, explain it. We, we believe this, this book is the God's, God's Word to us. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, correction, rebuking, and training in righteousness. It's literally breathed out by our Creator, the God of the universe. That's what this book is. It's a miracle. And friends, we have, I was, I was emailing with somebody this week, and he said, hey, what, what Bible translation do you guys use? Oh, well, we usually use the English Standard Version, the ESV. It's a good, modern translation. But we have an abundance in our language. You can read the ESV, you can read the NIV, you can read the NLT, you can read the KJV, you can read the NKJV, you can read the CEV. I mean, there's, there's so, so many good translations in our language, and there's people around the world that don't have the Bible in their language. It's the Word of God, and, and because we live where we live, when we live, 
We have so much access to it. You can read it. You can pick up a Bible. We want to give you a Bible if you don't have one. You can download one on your phone. That Your phone will read it to you in your earbuds if you like. You can connect it to your speaker system in your car. I mean, there's so many ways. And yet, you know what? It's, it's still not easy. There's still a lot of other things that are like clamoring for our attention. But he says, blessed are those who hear and keep the word of God. Sometimes we don't hear it, right? My phone, my phone, I have an, an iPhone, and my phone will give me readouts. This is a really, I hate this thing. It says, hey, last week you spent this number of hours on your phone every day. And I think it's wrong. I think it's like clocking things that aren't, I'm not actually on my phone. Because I know I can't possibly be on my phone for 27 hours a day. I, I just don't think that's, that's uh, mathematically possible. But I will tell you, like, there's a lot of stuff on there. And I like to listen to the news, and I like to listen to music, and I like to watch videos about random things. And if you add up all the time I do, do doing those things, probably the time I spend reading, listening, memorizing, meditating on the scriptures is probably a fraction of those other things. I don't, I don't spend as much time hearing God's word as I do hearing other things in the world. We're supposed to hear it. That's why I encourage you to get the, pick up a Bible and read it for yourself. Don't let, don't let Sunday morning when we open the Bible together, don't let that be your only time that you open the Bible in a week. Sometimes we don't hear it. Other times we don't obey it. I had something interesting happen in the last couple of weeks. I go through life, I think I'm generally a pretty nice person, you know, I try to, try to love other people as best as I can, I know I'm not perfect at it, but, but I, was, I was shown in the last two weeks like a massive hole in my following of Jesus. Somebody called me out. I'm not going to get into particulars, but they, they be, like, I, I would normally say, Seth, how, do you, how are you doing as loving your neighbor as yourself? I'd say, oh. You know, probably 75, 80%. I'm pretty good. Maybe 90. But I, I was reminded of, of how selfish I can be, how, how unloving I can be. When someone, someone, texted my wife, someone texted my wife and said, does Seth not like me? And it's kind of funny, but... It's kind of not. Because what I did is I created a, a place in my life, you know, and in that place in my life, I said, that place in my life, that is for me. And if somebody else steps into that place, I don't need to love them. They're invading my space. They're invading my time. I had given myself permission in this limited place in my life to, to be like, you know what, I don't, I don't need to follow Jesus in that. And this person, they just, they just popped that bubble. And it just cut me to the heart. I thought, oh my goodness. How many places in my life am I walking around with massive blind spots? See, sometimes, sometimes that's what we do. We, we think we're obeying, but we may be carving out places in our life where actually we are not obeying. Other times, we, we might be just willfully ignoring what God says. God, I know you said this. I know you say I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, but have you ever met my neighbor? Have you ever met my family? Have you ever met my, my friends and, and how irritating they can be or my siblings? Or have you, you, you must not have met them or you would not have written this. You would have written this with a parenthesis and it would have been something like this. Love your neighbor as yourself except when they really get on your nerves except when they really hurt you, except when they're really, really, really mean. So in those instances, we don't obey. We just ignore them. We say, you know what, God, you must not have been talking about that. And yet Jesus says, 
Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and then keep it. Now, what happens if we do? If we, if we do, we avoid two things, two things that he says here. There's two mouse traps, if you want to call them those, that can be avoided. And the first one, the first one is um, condemnation. If we hear what God says in his word and do it, we obey it, we put it into practice through his help, we escape condemnation. Look what he says in verse 29 and following. He's, he's talking about, he says to the, the people of Israel, the, the God's people, you guys are evil. It's e- this generation is evil. In verse 30, he says, For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Now, that doesn't make sense to you. He's talking about an Old Testament story. Uh, there's a, a book. You've probably, you probably know about chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Jonah, where Jonah gets a commission from God. He flees. He gets thrown into the ocean. A whale comes up, swallows him, right? This whole, but in chapter 3, we find the end of the story. The reason Jonah was running away from God is because God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah hated Nineveh. He hated the people in Nineveh. They were dirty, rotten enemies to the people of God. So he didn't want to go. So finally, he obeys God. He goes to Nineveh, and he calls out, 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then then look what it says. Look what the people of Nineveh, who didn't know God, they were pagan idol worshipers. They were as cruel as cruel could be. That's why Jonah didn't like them. Verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God. That's, that's, they heard what Jonah said. They believed God, and they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. See what they did? They heard, and they obeyed. And Jesus says, those guys are going to be your judges, this, this evil generation. He, he, said, he goes on and says, the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, she's going to rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So here is a queen. She, had, she was not part of God's people. She probably traveled from, as far as best we could tell, like Yemen, the south part of the Arabian Peninsula, hundreds of miles through the desert to go see Solomon because of what she'd heard about him. And in 2 Chronicles 9, 5, and 6, we, see, we hear her voice. She says to the king, Solomon, the report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom, but I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. See, she heard and she had some questions. So then she, she got on her camel or however she, she got there and she traveled, and she gets there, and she hears him, and she sees him, and she's believing. She, she's, she's at that same place. She heard, and she's obeying. And Jesus says to the generation, they want a sign. They want more. They've seen him drive out demons. They've seen and heard about him raising the dead. They've seen all the things that he's done. They've heard his teaching, and yet they want more things. They want another sign. And Jesus says, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. This godless Gentile queen and the wicked people of Nineveh will rise up at the final judgment and condemn the the people of God, the people who call themselves the people of God of Jesus' day. That's what he's saying. Why? Because because Jonah, or the people of Nineveh, And the queen of the south, they heard what God said and they responded appropriately. Now when he he talks about condemning here, I think there's a couple couple things. There is, for us today, there's eternal condemnation. If we don't hear the words of Jesus, hear what he says, and respond, ultimately in the, the gospel, believing the gospel, that we're sinners, Christ came, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, rose again from the dead, is coming again. If we don't believe the gospel message, then we will be eternally condemned in a place of judgment the Bible calls hell. 
That message is for, for everyone. The other side of condemnation, though, I think there, that, that we can have, we can incur, is we're not ultimately condemned like that. But friends, you and I, we can walk around and we can live like with, with big bubbles in our life of places we say, God, nah, this, this place, this area is off limits. I'm keeping this area of my life for me. If we don't hear and obey God's word, we are in danger of condemnation. Both in, in the end, the end judgment, I think even today. Secondly, the second mousetrap to avoid is hypocrisy. This is what Jesus is getting to in the last section. If we hear what Jesus says and we obey it, we listen to it, we will keep from being hypocrites. We will keep from hypocrisy. Jesus pronounces woe. This is pain or, or um, just hard circumstances over these people, displeasure over the Pharisees. He uses the word six times. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mints and rue and every herb, and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. He says, woe to them. Now, here's the deal about the Pharisees. If you would have looked at the Pharisees, you would have seen people who were zealous on the outside for obeying what God said. These are the people who, who they would have been very religious. They might have had like well, they weren't Christians, but they would have had the, the bumper stickers, and they might have listened to the right radio station, and they, they, might, you know, they, they might have done all the external trappings that we would think constitute a, a person who's following God. So much so that, that they would go to their herb garden, right? They didn't have herb, herbs on the shelf like we have them today. Maybe you could go to a market and buy some herbs, but for the most part, the way they would flavor their food was by growing little herb gardens in their house. So these guys were so zealous about the external things that would impress other people that this little herb garden that they had, which probably nobody else would even think about tithing from, they would be very judicious about, about making sure that they gave 10% of this little herb garden to the temple. But it was all an external kind of facade because they had this, this outside kind of appearance that they wanted people to see, but they neglected the hard things. They neglected justice. They neglected the love of God. They were hypocrites. See, what the Pharisees did is they would hear what God said. They knew his word. Jesus, Jesus reiterated that for them. He said, you guys search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. These people, they knew the scriptures backwards and forwards. But their response, instead of like really keeping it, their response was, well, what can we do on the outside so that people think we're keeping it? What they were really interested in was what people thought about them. And that's what Jesus is calling out here. And he's saying, hey, if you, if you listen to what I say, you listen to the word of God, and you actually keep it deep down in all the ways that it applies to your life, it will keep you from being a hypocrite like the Pharisees. So those are the two things. We, if we hear and obey God's word, we... we We'll escape condemnation, and we will not be hypocrites. And then he, he gives a couple things, a couple good things. He says, you'll be blessed. He says this in verse 20, 28. Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You're blessed if you hear the word of God and keep it. What, what about when the word of God, hearing it and keeping it, is, is difficult or unpopular? He says, even then, you will be blessed. 
if you hear the word of God and keep it. No, we don't, we don't attain salvation by obedience. That is by grace, through faith. But there's certainly blessing. When we hear the word of God and keep it, when we believe the gospel message, we're saved from condemnation eternally. When we hear the word of God and keep it, we are, our, our, uh, our deeds and actions in this life, I think they, they go before us. First Corinthians talks about how all of our, our actions and our deeds are going to be tested by fire, and some of them are going to be burned up, and some of them are going to exist through the fire. So part of the blessing is, is there will be rewards in heaven if you hear God's word and keep it. To go back to my example, if you love your neighbor as yourself in, in all the places that you are and thereby witness to the gospel and how your life has changed, I think there's going to be blessing and reward in that. So one of the good things about hearing and obeying is being blessed. That does, no, no, hear, make sure you hear this. This does not mean that if we hear what God says and do it, that you will be popular. It does not mean if you hear what God says and do it, you will be rich. It does not mean that if you, you hear what God says and do it, you are promised good health for all your days. It does not mean any of those things. God could give you those things. If we, I think if we hear what he says and follow it, there are good, tangible things that can happen in our life, in our finances, in our health, in our relationships. But this isn't necessarily a promise that if we obey, then we're, we're in this little deal and God is just going to make our lives easy. That's not what he's saying. But there is intrinsic blessing, intrinsic blessing in it. Second, second thing uh, that I think this text points out is that when we hear, hear and obey, it lets our light shine to the world. People will stand up and take notice. He says in verse 36, if your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright. So the more we take in God's word, we hear it and we obey it. Our light is wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. In other words, there's not hypocrisy. The more we hear and obey, the more we start to look like the Savior and the less open to hypocrisy we are. We're not just putting on a facade on the outside of our life so that people will say good things about us or think well of us. But we're actually being changed and transformed by His Spirit. There's one other thing I thought of on this, one other blessing, and it has to do with letting our light shine, because when we hear what God says and we obey what he says, we are walking in the footsteps of the great hearer and the great obeyer who went before us. Jesus says, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And friends, he is the one who ultimately did that. He understood God's will. And he did it. So much so that, that, and I'm just amazed by this story. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he went to the cross, you know, what, you know what he said, right? He's wrestling with God. He's saying, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. I don't, I don't want to do this if there's another way. And then, and then he, he says, but. But not my will be done, but your will be done. See, when we hear what God says and we obey it, we are becoming like Jesus and we're following in his footsteps. So two questions. Two questions. Are we listening? Are we listening? The Bible is the primary way God speaks to us. I would argue any other way he speaks to you needs to line up with the Bible. If you feel like God told you something and it doesn't line up with what the Bible says, then God wasn't speaking to you there. God is speaking to you here. This is the measuring line of, of what God speaks, and nothing else that he says to you will ever contradict this. 
So are we listening? Do we take it in? It's just a time to do some like assessment. For me, how much time do I spend doing other stuff? Versus how much time do I spend listening to God? A lot of times, I'll, I'll get up in the morning, and my, I got this bad lower back thing, so I get up, and this is going to sound weird, but I do yoga so that I can uh, just stretch, stretch myself out and feel good in the morning. And I'll put in my earbuds, and I'll listen to my Bible reading plan. And that's, that's good, you know, 15, 20 minutes. It reads it to me. Yesterday, though, we, we take Sabbath on Saturdays. We try to. Yesterday, we didn't have anything else going on, so we just sat. So in the morning, everybody else was sleeping. I got up, got my coffee, went outside. It was a beautiful day, and I hadn't done this in a long time, or a number, or a number of days at least. I just took my Bible, and I sat with my Bible open, and instead of like having to be in a rush because I had a schedule to keep, I was able to just sit and just soak and just listen. And it was, it was a sweet time. And I, I, haven't, I hadn't listened to God's word in that way in a while. So I just encourage you, however, however you need to do, carve out some time this Memorial Day weekend, whether it's with coffee or wherever you, you like to be, carve it out, spend some time, pick a book, I don't care. I read Ecclesiastes. Not a very happy book, but it's got some really good, good things in it. But, but just open it up, soak in it, and listen, and ask him to speak. And then, and then the other question, are we obeying? When we, when we find something in there, when the Holy Spirit comes, and maybe you get a text message like I did, said, hey, Seth, what are you doing, man? How do you respond in that moment? You say, you know what, well, there's a, there's a reason that that's okay for me to act that way. Or do we say, God, I am so sorry. I didn't think about it that way. Please change, change my heart. Please help me to love the people in my life, even the people that are difficult. That's the, the response of obedience If you're walking around and you think, man, I'm doing a great job, I, I, you pray this prayer. Psalm 139, David prays, he says, search me, O Lord, and know my, know my thought. Try me and know my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me. You pray that prayer and ask, ask God, the Holy Spirit, to reveal to you ways that you are not following what God has to say in his word. I guarantee you, probably there's at least one in each one of our lives. And if he reveals something like that to you, I, this, is, this is the good news of the gospel. What we do with that is we say, God, I'm sorry. God, please change me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for even those sins. Even when I've been a jerk to people. He died on the cross for those sins. He was the perfect hearer and keeper of your word. So that even when I am not, I'm not condemned. See, we don't have to be crushed when we, we fall short because Jesus has been strong for us. Hear and obey God's word. So Jesus is saying to his, his followers, you want to follow him? That's, that's what we got to do. Hear and obey. If we do that, we won't be condemned, we won't be hypocrites. We'll be blessed, with eternal blessing, being with him, and we'll be blessed because we are becoming more like him, and our light will shine for a world that desperately needs it. And friends, what would it be like if as the people of God, we say, Lord, just have your way. Please speak to me. Please help me to hear you and help me to obey. If when our lives are out of whack, we would say, Lord, I'm sorry, and we might even have to go to somebody and say, you know what, you were right. I was short with you, and I acted annoyed. I'm just talking to myself right now. Will you please forgive me? That wasn't right. People wouldn't have a category for that. 
Say, what's up with that person? What would, what would it be like? Lord, we, we thank you for your word. This is a challenging text. Jesus, I know there's, there's ways where my life is not in line with what your word says. I'm an imperfect man. Lord, I just bring that and confess it. I pray that you would, you would work, you would open my eyes, the eyes of my heart. Lord, that you would convict me of ways I'm not obeying or listening. That you would lead me. Lord, that, that my life, that our lives here, for all who know you, that we would be lights wherever we go this week. That people would see your love, your grace, your kindness in us. Or that we would not just have a facade of religiosity, but we would have a deep down following of, of you because you've gone before us. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.